Welcome to Sage Method Space. I'm one of the co-editors of a new book by Sage called Analyzing and Interpreting Qualitative Research after the interview. And I'm here to inter interview another one of the co-editors, Charles Vanover, who is here to talk about embodiment and abduction in qualitative research. We have an interview with um, one of the people in our book, um, Andrew J. Bingham, who discusses um, different processes of induction and deduction. So we'll, I'll put in the chat or in the link um, Andrea's interview. So here we wanted to talk about a little less rational, a little um, more emotional, intuitive processes, embodiment and abduction. And I wanted to start out with some, um, some definitions. And so for um, embodiment, what we wanna talk about is um, for a qualitative analyst, the idea is that how do I physically incorporate the data so that by interacting with the data, it becomes part of me and I am being able to draw, as we'll discuss, new and unexpected connections. So there's an idea that um, when we're trying to embody qualitative data, we're engaging with the data through body and mind, right? We're trying to engage with the words of our research participants, with the videos of our research participants, of the observations, of all of that material, to see people as total beings, understand their lawful lives, not just the data that's the trace of their experience. And um, use the body as a tool to access nonverbal experience and knowledge. And so that's both a way of analysis, but it's also a core embodiment is a core problem for qualitative researchers because um, it's very frequent that um, the people we interview, the people we observe, whatever our research designs, they may inhabit very different spaces than our own. A classroom feels very differently than um, an office, right? That those, they are organized around very different rhythms and so the people that are speaking from a classroom, their words connect to a different reality, a different set of feelings and movements and sounds than an office setting. Similarly, a, a prison block is different than a classroom, is different than an office. And for you know, committed, dedicated, qualitative researchers, we have to understand those processes of embodiment and figure out how to, you know, again, understand the full being, or as um, Johnny Saldana and Matt talk about, you know, analyze the full life of our, um, the people that are in our research studies. And so then abduction, I have two definitions. The first comes from um, Kathy Sharmaz, Sharmaz um, and I think that's how I pronounce it, um, who's very, this 208 definition is very still connected to induction. It's the idea as one is going through the data, as one is grounding one's experience of the data, one sees surprises and reality and normality or puzzles in the collected data. And then one tries to understand these puzzles and one, um, you know, one creates imaginative interpretations. Like what, how do we understand that surprise? How do we understand that, um, 
the puzzle. Another way of seeing it or related is that there's a really interesting group of qualitative researchers in organizational theory, um, and these are a bunch of them um, in the citations, who are focused on imaginative theory, theorizing and trying to use qualitative research in particular to really um, how can we create new theories about how organizations work and such work is critical in organizations given the incredible pace of change where whatever your preconceptions on what is happening, they rapidly come obsolete. And so here, objection is, is a mode of inquiry um, where deduction might prove something must be. Induction shows that that's occurring, but the logic and narrative abduction is that it suggests that something may be. So it's that inspiration, that moment of insight that um, they use the famous phrase from Gadmer's work, where one's turned around, when one sees the work that one's doing for so long in a new light. And so um, in our book, we take, um, and we, Paul and I were talking about this before the video, we take a particular stance towards abductive and embodied reasoning towards the process of discovery. So in anthropology and some other literatures, there's the idea that one creates these discoveries, perhaps through Dionysian revelries, where one drinks with one performance, dances all night, and does all, does all those things. And while we are certainly not opposed to such, our idea in our book, at least in these chapters, is that one, um, one moves towards discovery by um, patient, careful, right? Um, and the first example of that is in the section that I edited on transcription, where it's the idea that what's the, how do I embody the data? Well, I take the time to listen to the um, interviews, watch the videotapes, and I transcribe them. We emphasize in the book, Chapter by um, Sylvia Silvana de Gregorio. I think, how do I say that name? Hey, Silvana. Silvana de Gregorio. De Gregorio. Um, that talks about, you know, specifically describes how to use machine coding, machine transcription as the first pass. And then to build on that pass, listen to the interview, look at the Zoom tape and try to figure out how do I get the voices? How do I get these ideas? How do I you know, create a transcript of these content? In my chapter, I talk just some very simple ways of you know, using different fonts for the different voices in the text. It's very simple stuff that helps both me hear and embody the data by typing, by listening, by thinking, by engaging with that content, while simultaneously creating rich material for analysis. Um, and we have another chapter on conversation analysis where we can really go in depth and drill down into particular gestures, tones, voices, pauses, hesitations. And all of that work is both creating material for analysis, and then it's giving this chance to embody the data by typing, embody the data by hearing. And we're hoping that we're creating a field for suddenly I see, I'm surprised. Suddenly um, I have an insight. Suddenly I have an Charles, can you talk a little bit about how you think embodiment um, can influence the, your field of education? 
Yeah, it's a core issue for us. Um, I'll maybe talk about later some of my core issues, but in court across education, the issue is teachers live in a space that despite until maybe two years ago, when we started doing Zoom classes, was designed in the 19th century. So a classroom, what is a classroom? Well, it's actually a 19th century workplace. It looks exactly like um, the clerks would all sit together in their desks and type and, and do work that was all now been automated. Or the seamstress would all sit in front of frequently in a room and they would all work together. And so that type of work Place, which is does not exist really anymore outside of education, really shapes teachers and students' lives, and they have they inhabit a different space. And so then, as education researchers, we're try, always trying to understand um, both the words and then the worlds, the spaces that shape that. And um, Sarai Biglum, my favorite um, on that. And she has written brilliantly. And there's a brilliant book um, on that, and I'll remember it. <laughs> um, so yeah. that would be for embodiment, but that also goes in criminology, in health, in so many fields. You know, we're trying to understand life, not just the words. And how do you think um, those of us who are teaching qualitative research, how can we um, teach embodiment? I think that to teach embodiment, the first is to emphasize awareness, right? That, um, you know, that a problem for qualitative research always is that other methods are so analytical right? They're so logical, they're math-based. And so then when we talk about our feelings, when we talk about our embodied processes, you know, it, it, it seems very messy to people that are just driving home the logic, but it's, it's not woo-woo, it's central to good work. As again, Johnny Saldana, and I think it's Matt Olson in their Analyzing Life book, you know, they're really trying to help people understand how do we get at the life of the, these people, not just at remove. So that would be the first. And then the second is, um, you know, there's so much more interest nowadays, like every year. Um, more interest in arts-based approaches where, um, you know, read the data as a speech, you know, really, truly dance the data. Um, that's such a powerful methodology and it's a way of, um, you know, doing the two processes we told, right? So on the one hand, if I'm dancing the data, what am I doing? I'm trying to understand the feelings, the movement, the space that these people that I interview, that I observed experience, but I'm also trying to create new connections, use my full body to understand lives that, that are lived in other bodies. And, and um, I can also add that in, in the work that I do with memo writing, that memos are a place where you can also write about how bodies have to have, have bodies tell stories that when I when I um, conduct an interview um, there's there's the text that we're always drawn to of course but then there's the story that the body has been telling me during that encounter and so the memo is a place to write about what the body has told you in addition to what the words are in the in the transcript yeah the memoing again like so we're just we're so boring in this book, which is the most boring people, right? Our tool for embodiment is to write a memo, right? Who's the anthropologist? But we are just, um, 
you know, taking the time, creating, writing in our voice about the content, covering ground, right? Putting, you know, words on the page or, you know, talking it out or whatever we're doing, taping photographs, doodling, um, you know, we have, you know, drawing the data, creating visual memos. There's so many approaches, but part of it is that we're slowing down the analysis process so that we can have these connections and that we don't know what's going to trigger it, right? But our approach is by listening, to, by writing out the transcription, by coding both from deductive processes, but leaving room for live coding or you know, new insights for in vivo coding, that we're hoping to have that moment of insight where that then sort of guides our study. And I'm also seeing perhaps a shift to, to more video interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so then that gives both um, the great virtue of, of such videos is, as we can see here, is that you can see, you can connect gestures with work. You might not, you know, that's not the same as a face-to-face -face encounter, but then there's a lot of information that is um, conveyed, you know, by the particular gesture of the particular person who's being interviewed, right? And um, the smiles, those hands movements. But then it also poses this analytic problem of how do I incorporate that? How do I communicate this other dimension? And we talked about um, one of the chapters in the book is by James, what is his name? It's James, James Bernauer. Bernauer. And that chapter, what James does, and it's a really, he talks about oral da audio data, but I think it easily applies to video data that his goal is to, you know, delay the moment that the, that the data is transcribed or written up as long as possible. So he describes, you know, coding, you know, a herd story, coding a piece of tape rather than encoding maybe a set of pieces of tape rather than a set of transcripts or chunks of transcripts mm -hmm. so that he hears the voices, right? That he, and if you're coding video, you see the gestures and that information is kept till much later in the process. Mm -hmm. yeah, and also uh, I might appoint people to Elsa Gonzalez and Ivana Lincoln's chapter on cross-cultural research, which um, kind of makes this even more um, complex, right? Because if we're working ac across cultures, that's a different kind of embodiment. Well, and then we have um, an ICQI video from Elsa and Yavana that really goes into their work. And that's really a good piece to read alongside the chapter because the problem that um, Elsa conf and Yavana confronted is a problem that haunts us in so many different ways, which is that Elsa interviewed the leaders of Mexican universities. They spoke to Elsa in Spanish. So that's, you know, that's translation one. Mm -hmm. And then for us in this video, right, the work of translating that, all of the complexity, the sweat of figuring out, pondering those words, that's one level. But there's a whole other level, which is that Mexican universities don't operate the same as US universities. And so from an inferential level, even from an emotional level, they're describing you know, very different organizations that it would be very easily to misconstrue, right? That no, what they're talking about is these 
cultural processes, not these US cultural processes. And so again, all the complexity of managing those translations, that work provides material for embodiment and material that creates, we hope, moments of insight, flashes of this is different, this is new, this is um, really critical material that we need to understand so that, you know, the uni North American university system can work better and we won't suffer some, so much won't be lost. So, so for, for a student who's kind of starting out and who's used to text, 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 and reading, 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 um, what might you recommend that that student do to kind of um, move into more of an embodied sensibility? Well, one of our chapters, um, it's one of them that I keep coming back to, Jamie Lee Fiddler. She talks about how um, she would listen to the entire audio tape of her previous interview before going and doing another focus group with the same group of informants. And she would actually listen to it in the car, mm -hmm. right? And so then just slowing down to hear, you're hearing voices, you're hearing connections, and you're also seeing the interaction over time, right? In the original time. And that also might create um, you know, room for discovery. Jamie would also um, write down core ideas, core chunks of the transcripts and note cards, and then she'd carry them around with her, right? And so that's also like, um, I mean, just to, to be that, give that commitment where you, know, you have a physical paper note card, you're looking at it on the bus, you're looking at it before you sleep, but you're just constantly opening yourself up for a moment of abduction, for an unexpected connection or surprise, um, that, um, that would be a start. Mm -hmm. um, another way from um, Sally Galman or Campbell Galman is, you know, drawing it, you know, and, and I tell my students this, um, you know, if you sat and did one or two drawings for every interview and you really, you know, put a little bit of effort in and did all that, that's going to be this rich resource when it comes to write up. And it's going to remind you of so much stuff, right? You're going to have insights, memories that'll come out of that. And who knows, maybe you'll use it in your final write up. Maybe it'll always be submerged. Um, one of the things that Johnny Solana always emphasized about art space processes is that, you know, you don't have to create cats, you know, you don't have to create a huge stage show, Beethoven's Fifth, to be successful, right? Um, you can just use it as a way of embodying the data, of preparing the field for insight. Mm -hmm. And um, so that would be another way. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your ethnodramas and your work in that in that territory? Yeah, so I have done, um, I was completely black. So my story was that I had worked so hard on my dissertation and I had tried so hard and I had just wrote and wrote and coded and coded and stuff like that. And I did defend and all that, but I really couldn't communicate um, what I had found and part of that, I think now was a process error that I needed to have been memoing all the way through. But I, um, when I was doing that work, I was very isolated. I was part of the qualitative community, but the memoing um, part of it, you know, that's not, that didn't get to me. I didn't get it. And so I was really, really blocked. And so then, and what was coming out was this really tight writing that was really, I didn't like, mm -hmm. let alone the reviewers, right? I didn't like what I was writing about this dissertation that I had given my heart to, 
And it was just like that. Mm -hmm. And so then by performing, and it was so frightening, um, you know, it's like, it takes a lot of courage to do art space. Be, I mean, to get up and do a show, create a script, get my friends to do it. Um, we started with one of my friends from Michigan and we, I had enough connections to get that first show done, but it was so frightening to do. But I also suddenly, um, one, I saw how the data could work as a script, but then for beginners, for people, you know, thinking of ways, the audience discussion, the rehearsals, were these amazing opportunities to talk about the data from my perspective or to hear back the data from my perspective. And it helped me unblock. It helped me sort of develop a different voice um, that wasn't based on the policy materials that I had been doing but instead comes out of these interactions about, um, you know, the courage and suffering of the teachers that I interviewed. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, that process, right, where you're scripting, rehearsing, listening to feedback, where it's, I mean, it's this, again, both Norman Denson and Johnny Solana say, it really can be the most powerful way to analyze data but it's also, um, you know, it's so much work, right? But it's good work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so what I'm hearing from you is um, that our, our challenge is not to just analyze words, but to analyze spaces and to analyze um, atmospherics and to analyze how bodies occupy those spaces and inhabit them, um, which leads us to things like ethnodrama and all these other forms of all these other ways of knowing. Yeah, that remember people live in their bodies, mm -hmm. right? The words come out of their bodies. Their feelings are expressed by words, but their words aren't their feelings. Mm -hmm. And so then as qualitative researchers, that can be such a core issue because the world of the classroom is not the world of the office. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had 30 years of people coming from offices that they're going to do all this stuff in the schools. And until two years ago, when um, you know, the Zoom teaching came, nothing really changed for the better. I mean, there's some incremental change, but it was still mostly a 19th century system. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just weren't able to find our way through that. And so then so many in criminology and how, you know, there's actually great art space research about dancing psychosis, right? And try, how do you, how do you communicate the feeling of being a teenager having a psychotic episode and then being on the drugs in a way that creates compassion rather than othering? There's a great set of art space research that does just that helps people envision this very altered experience. And such things go through, you know, up and down are all sorts of differences, um, sexual differences, racial differences, all that, you know, that body's always there. And how do we understand it? And then how do we gain insight about it, right? Again, that they're we're both understanding the body, but we're also just, even if we're very text-based, we want insight, mm -hmm. right? We just don't want to like say the same thing that's always been said. I mean, we want to have these creative moments, I think. I do, uh, you do. And so then that abductive process is, again, from our work, it comes from these patient work doing practices of data analysis. And we have 25 chapters, 25 master chefs giving you their practices of that. Um, and it's out of that work 
that insight comes, that that turning around comes, that um, I think really make qualitative studies. I might also point people to Alison Welker and George Cambrelos' chapter, um, where they talk about the researcher kind of cre uh, creating a map in their mind. And um, they talk about actually uh, connecting this piece of data to that piece of data and actually making a kind of map, right, physically. Um, yeah, so here is their chapter. I, mean, I don't know if you can see it, but um, that I love that work, right? Um, I mean, I love that work in that there, here's pictures, here's text, here's drawings, here's all sorts of different ways that we're trying to, you know, interact, engage with this data to try to, you know, create these new ideas. And then they just go on, they have a post-structural framework. So they're not trying to come to conclusions. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to, you know, end the flow. It's just gonna go on and on. Exactly. And um, I think that even, even if our goal is to, to finally write something, all of these things change our writing dramatically, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and then it's also, it's a way of, again, which I discovered, um, you know, I mean, not discovered, but experience, um, you know, it's writing the memos, talking out the data, finding these forums where if you do an ethnodrama, you're in front of people, there's an audience, there's, you know, all the stage fright, all of that stuff, it creates this commitment, but then this opportunity to think on your feet and you know create a new trail where your um, it creates a that voice, your own voice, right? And so again, another way to say it is all these are ways to create your own voice, your researcher's voice the voice that takes you through the material, the voice that helps others hear the participants' voices. Um, your voice never disappears. There's, that's always there. And so thinking about how do I create that voice? How do I embody it? How do I always even discover it? Those are such a critical thing for qualitative researchers because we do, we live in meanings, we live in words. You know, that's what we do. Do you find that um, that transcription and, and the practices of transcription are still um, evolving? Uh, are, they, are we still kind of on the verge of new strategies for transcription? Well, I love Silvana's chapter um, and I really recommend it for people doing big projects because you can now with the auto transcription you can do such very different research design, mm -hmm. right? So Silvana talks about how, um, you know, I get my auto transcription back 90 minutes or less after my interview. And then um, I can then re-interview my informant the next day or a couple hours later. And I have this record of what they said right in front of me. Right, so then I'm actually, the technology is in some ways allowing this much more fluid and in a sense more, more empirical, um, you know, database work because I have access to it so quickly. But we also emphasize that that machine coding is just the first step, right? You can't let a machine transcribe your work because that's, it's you have to put in who said what, how did this work? What are the pauses? There's so much that has to be thought through and that thinking through then, that's where still that old fashioned, you know, qualitative research where, you know, back in the olden days, people took notes, right? Maybe they had a big tape recorder, maybe a cassette tape recorder that always broke um, as we have Experience, right? Um, you know, from that to the foot pedal to listening to doing all that, that patient work is still so much a part of qualitative inquiry, um, the thrill of it. Um, you know, it, it can't be outsourced. You know, one has to engage with the data, 
otherwise um, it's what we are opposed to in mixed in what we would think um, is bad mixed method research, which is where the qualitative research is just used for quotes. It's used for window dressing, like used to illustrate an interesting survey finding rather than as material to truly understand do you have a sort of um, um, a kind of a wish list or a study that you would like to do if you had resources and time, something on the horizon that you'd like to embark on? Yeah, I am playing with different ideas. Um, one is that I might like write my book. Mm -hmm. So and by writing my book, I mean like I have all this dissertation data, I have ethnodramed it. And so I'm very much thinking of, you know, rewriting it, like, then where, how could I really communicate this in writing? Um, I, over the summer, I just, I have abductively go through this and I've had various revelations. The next is um, I'm fascinated with teachers and especially AP teachers and especially teachers of my generation. And so then the next thing would be, can I get in, find a way into AP art teachers and hear their worlds over 20 years? You know, go back to Chicago, work here in Florida with AP English teachers and hear their stories. Because I think that people like that, that are really working with core cultural materials in a way, but also in, with they might have these great stories that would allow us to understand um, these last 20 years and really think about, um, you know, what's happened here. How can we create a more humane system, a more efficient system? It's not wrong to want the want kids to learn more. I mean, learning those learning outcomes are critical for adult success. Um, I mean, my African American friends are always all concerned about the wealth gap, right? You know, like how do we solve the wealth gap? How do we give kids these analytic skills that are being denied them? And um, so I'm, you know, those are real issues for us, but also more humane. Um, it's dreary right now in the classroom. Endless testing, um, really structured curricula that are soulless. And, um, and so how do we, you know, how do we do well and good? How do we help kids learn more because they should, but in a way that really inspires them? And it's not just these dreary landscapes, high school testing and um, overstressed teachers, and, you know, people, you know, again, the teachers, they're all way overstressed, the body's breaking down, um, all of that stuff, you know, to try to think through that. And we're just um, maybe a little bit of progress, but I don't know. Um, it's been hard to see. I mean, I fought for almost 10 years and I've been 20 years out, 20 years out, and it's still, um, I don't know. I mean, I work with teachers, so I care about it. It's not a spectacle to me. I'm, engaged in it, but um, it's a hard one to think about. Yeah, I also find that the graduate students who are doing qualitative work, they get really, um, um, it, there's a kind of tedium that they fall into, and I think the embodiment would really bring their work alive. Um, and so I think it's, it's sort of a way of knowing, but it's also just a way to add some, uh, to breathe life into your work. Well, and then again, it's like that they give in what I would say, I don't know, let's just say this, they give in to the, the, the positivist critique. So yes, survey research is wonderful. I you my friends from survey researchers, right? Um, you know, it's really hard. It's very complex. It's mathematical. There's so many different elements of it, but that's not what we do, right? And so we have to embrace our messiness, right? We have to embrace the fact that we really are talking about embodiment and feelings and bodies because that's real, right? 
that in our methods, that's what we pick up. That's what we have to understand. And then to, you know, to do it joyously, joyfully. Um, so much of the, for beginners, I mean, the, the bad beginner qualitative research study, case A, the first primary case is all my effort goes into the interviews. I'm running out of time with my committee. I pay someone to transcribe. I do a very atheoretical coding and the themes emerge and I write this up very haphazardly trying to get out. Mm -hmm. And like the embodiment, the this work in our book, the idea is to really take the time, you know, up front so that the words flow at the end, right? transcribe and do all that so that, you know, then when I'm writing, when I'm thinking, the words just come out. I remember this text, I remember that. I write the memo so I can go back to that great idea that I forgot, which you can see me forgetting. And, um, and all of that stuff flows out. And, um, and that's our perspective that it's just so much more joyous and energizing you know, to embrace being, you know, I'm qualitative, I interviews, I'm embodying, I'm having ideas, I'm having visions, I'm doing notebooks filled with pictures, I'm writing note cards, I'm listening to tapes on my way there. That's just who I am. Do you know what I mean? I Even the big study people, Josh and Adrian, Maureen, I have 157 interviews, right? And I'm like doing this process and we're hearing and we're pulling it all together, um, you know, and to really embrace that um, rather than, you know, again, like I I have these interviews and I'm just burning through it, getting done. Then, well, what does that dissertation sound like? It sounds like you burn through it. I mean, you can really hear it, right? If you come with a, come across those dissertations, it's really obvious that this was not engaged. This was not um, do that. And then how are you going to publish off of that? Mm -hmm. And I think problem. That even for experienced qualitative researchers, um, our book might help them just kind of expand their practices and to try 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 adding something new to their to what they've been doing, and that might they might sort of discover um, something different in their field. They might contribute in a different way. Um, they might just disseminate their work in, in a way that um, um, creates a larger audience. So I, th I think that um, for a, a range of, of researchers, I think that this idea of embodiment can really um, expand ways of knowing. Yeah, I think that it can just. Um that we just, you know, it's just ways of getting into that data and celebrating, you know, the nature of the type of work. Um, doesn't mean it's the only type. Um, you know, again, I structure to me is, I mean, this just for me, it exists. It's a real thing. Like race has patterns across the US, European situations, gender, those things. But these qualitative people were looking in you, these people, this moment in time, you know, trying to gain insight of that. And I think, you know, enhancing the worth of the people that we're talking about. And I think that's a great call. It's mm -hmm. just enormous, satisfying, and interesting to me. Um, you know, uh, I've seen 20 years of it. It's utterly fascinating to hear the story to imagine these classrooms, to imagine, you know, to interact with these people, these ghosts of these people, these transcripts of these people, these tapes. So are there, are, is there something I should be asking you that I haven't asked you? I don't think so. Um, I think that we have, um, that that's it. Um, I will try to have, oh, the book that I was mentioning um, on the classroom is Schoolwork by Sarai Bicklin. And that is a great book and uh, very powerful for people. Um, you'll be surprised at that book. And, um, and that's 2030. Um, so 
you know, that would be, I think we just conclude by emphasizing, you know, it's just the old thing that we're about to patiently doing the work to create, you know, abduction, surprises, insight, and then joy, right? That there's just, um, I tell my students like, just, you're going to have so much fun if you allow yourself to have the fun, right? Um, to really, you know, again, like Jamie, Lee Fiddler, you know, listen to those tapes in your car, write those note cards, carry them around. Like Sally, write these doodles, like Elaine and yourself, doing these memos, and comp doing them out, going back, going forward, all of that stuff. Um, I just really think that it, it just enhances the work so much. And it, you know, it makes the, our vocation and advocation. Mm -hmm. and I, I see this sort of creating the map as you go. Mm -hmm. Creating the map as you go. Okay. Um, anything other, any other final words or? Well, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate your time, Charles. Mm -hmm. Thank you for help, all your help.